Hi, and welcome to Author Uncut. I'm your host and author, Patrice Williams Marks. Today I'll be reading Chapter 3 of my revenge thriller, Counterpunch. But first, if you enjoy my podcast, I'd be grateful if you spread the word by leaving a rating and a review. Author Uncut can be found wherever you enjoy listening to your podcast. Here's the synopsis of Counterpunch. Everest was not the perfect mom, but what she was, was fierce. After her husband Anthony died at the hands of a drunk driver, it was up to her to raise her daughter Mo alone. Her love for Mo was both unmistakable and unshakable. But when Mo failed to return home from swim practice with not so much as a text, Everest knew something was wrong. Will Everest find Mo in time to save her life? Better still, what will she do to the scumbag that brutalized her daughter? Make him pay. Chapter 3 The Notification Everest had been this frightened only once before when a rather lanky patrol woman with a severe chin and broad shoulders knocked on her door. The lights from the patrol vehicle were silently swirling. Why didn't she turn them off? A second patrolman sat in the vehicle. He refused to cast his eyes towards the front door where Everest would appear. He was not cut out for this part of the job. The patrol woman drummed on the front door. Everest opened the door partially before swinging it open the rest of the way once she saw who it was. Mo stood in the background next to the dining table draped in a festive tablecloth. Birthday balloons with streamers attached in a rainbow of colors dotted the popcorn ceiling. The death notification was the least desirable job a cop could have, and they were never trained to handle the family. That was obvious from her uncomfortable stamps. My name is Officer Goodroy with the Mason Police Department. May I come in? Although the patrol woman's presence was sterile, her voice showed a little bit of compassion. Before stepping in, she gestured for the other cop to flip the lights bar off. He was more than happy to follow her orders if it meant staying inside the patrol vehicle. Everest allowed Officer Goodroy to enter their home as she closed the door behind her. Goodroy's first instinct was to comment on the birthday decorations, but bit her tongue. It was no longer a joyous occasion for this family with the news she was about to deliver. Anything she said would come off as callous and completely inappropriate. I'm sorry to interrupt your birthday celebration, she said to Everest. Can we have a seat? Everest gestured for Officer Goodroy to sit on the couch as she removed a book from Anthony's favorite recliner and took a seat herself. With a stiff back, Everest sat on the edge of that recliner, waiting for the other shoe to drop. Officer Goodroy tried to prepare Everest and Mo for the shock, but could a person really be prepared for the news that someone they loved had died unexpectedly? I'm sorry, but I have to report. Everest had to remind herself to breathe as she heard the string of words. Your husband, Anthony was in a very bad car accident today and was killed. I'm sorry this happened. The air was sucked out of the room, leaving a ringing in her ears. But after several minutes of utter silence, Everest managed to ask, What happened? Where did it happen? What time did it happen? Whose fault was it? Where could she see Anthony? Where was he? Goodroy answered all of her questions while studying Everest and Mo's every action and reaction. Is there someone I can call for you for support? Other family members? Parents? 
ever thought of only one thing that good Roy could do for her at that moment. She looked up through dry, desolate eyes and asked to see her husband immediately. Goodroy agreed and offered to drive Everest and Moe to the coroner's office, as Everest was in no shape to drive herself. Goodroy explained that an autopsy was planned and that Anthony's body sustained severe trauma. She wanted to elaborate in further detail, but hesitated with Moe still in the room. She thought it prudent and compassionate to wait until Everest was alone. The drive to the coroner's office was in silence, except for the calls over the police radio. Goodroy drove as her partner sat stoically in the passenger seat. He was a rookie who hid behind a put-on-tough exterior to camouflage his inexperience and weak will for this side of police work. Mo rested her head on Everest's shoulder, not yet coming to terms with what had been told to her. She held a gift on her lap from Anthony. It was found inside Anthony's vehicle after the accident. It had Mo's name on it. It had been tossed around and slammed against the inside of the vehicle during the accident, and, although it was a little worse for wear, it remained intact. Mo refused to open the present that day and every day since, as she felt doing so would erase her dad permanently from her life. By clutching that present firmly in place, she could cling to the possibility that it was all a horrible mistake and that her dad would be coming home as planned. The coroner's office was an unassuming, one-level, stucco building with no windows. The only way anyone would know what lay beyond its walls was if they were specifically looking for the building. Its dilapidated sign faced the main street and was covered in overgrowth. Any passerby could only make out the word county from the sign. Goodroy and her partner ushered Everest and Moe into the main lobby. There was a clerk behind a glass window and uncomfortable chairs lined up against the walls, which were painted a dingy seafoam green. A janitor reached for a small trash can and emptied it inside a larger tub. He took great pains to avoid eye contact with Everest and Mo. Perhaps in the beginning he would have offered a smile or a consoling glance, but he had learned after many years of cleaning this solemn area that a smile could be misinterpreted. The janitor simply went about his duties, interacting with no one. Evers and Moe took a seat as Goodroy approached the clerk behind the window. The clerk slid open the window and conversed with her. This was nothing like what Evers pictured. It seemed business as usual in this office, except that the business was the business of death. That's what Anthony's life came down to, a thin file with a few pieces of paper inside. Goodroy gestured for Everest to join her at the window as she had to sign a form and triplicate before she was handed Anthony's belongings that were inside his pockets. Everest examined the contents, his wallet, no cash, his watch, and his wedding ring which he kept in his pocket, as it was hazardous to wear while at work. The clerk typed information into a computer using the two-finger hunt-and-peck method. Once she found what she was looking for on the screen, she pulled out a checkbook and wrote a check for $87.12. The payee was Everest. The clerk tore the check from the book and held it out to her. Everest was informed by Goodroy that the $87.12 was found on Anthony's person at the time of his death. Everest reached for it, never imagining herself cashing a check from the coroner's office. It was just too much to take in. Without a word or any indication, she fainted, collapsed to the ground, unconscious. Her two limbs, which had never failed her before, gave way. 
When Evers awoke, she was in another room on a couch meant for grieving families. Mo sat on the floor, cross-legged, in front of her, willing her to open her eyes. It worked that time. Evers swung her legs off the couch and set her feet firmly on the ground. Thidroy handed her a small paper cup filled with water. Evers sipped the water while regaining her composure. Thidroy reassured her that everything she was experiencing was normal and that she did not have to proceed if she was not ready. But Evers knew she had to see Anthony now. If she had over one hundred years to prepare for this moment, she still would not be ready. Evers glanced over at a nearby table and noticed a filled trash bag. Goodroy's partner stood up and carried the bag over to Everest. Everest was confused at first until she opened it. Inside were the clothes Anthony was wearing that day, the clothes she laid out for him less than eight hours ago. But what in the world would cause someone to be so uncaring as to put her Anthony's clothes in a plastic trash bag? A trash bag! Goodroy immediately picked up on Everest's disdain for the trash bag and instructed her partner to go to the car and get the extra backpack from the trunk. Her partner did as instructed and left the room. Mo watched him leave with heightened interest, wondering if she would ever see him again, too. Everest took a deep breath before she reached inside the bag. She felt the texture of flannel she pulled out Anthony's blue plaid shirt. The collar had dark blood stains on the inside band. How could blood stain the inside of the shirt and not the outside? She thought to herself. She pushed the shirt back inside the bag while reaching for his jeans, pulling them out a quarter of the way. They were Anthony's favorite jeans, and he wore them every chance he got. She ran her finger over the small holes created by the fire sparks while he welded. Surprisingly, there was no sign of blood on his jeans. Perhaps she could clean them and keep them folded up and ready to grab at a moment's notice. Everest stuffed the jeans back inside the bag and twisted it shut with a knot as Goodroy's partner re-entered the room with the backpack. He placed it on the couch next to the garbage bag. Are you ready? Goodroy questioned Everest. No, Everest was not ready but she stood up anyway. She grabbed the garbage sack and backpack and placed them on a nearby table. She then gestured for Mo to sit on the couch. Ever sat down next to Mo and assured her that she would be back. She explained that she needed to spend time alone with Anthony. Although Mo was young, she knew exactly what her mother meant. She felt ashamed and small for not wanting to see her father too. Somehow Everest knew this, so she gave Mo a tight bear hug and a kiss on the forehead before leaving. Goodroy's partner watched Mo as the two exited the room. The door shut behind them with the sound of a tight seal, a door that separated denial from reality. Everest wondered if she would be led to an arctic cold room with a wall of steel drawers Would a gum-chewing attendant walk over to a drawer in the center and pull out the slab? Would a white sheet be covering Anthony's face? Would the attendant wait until she nodded before folding the sheet down to reveal his face? Would Anthony look the same now that his soul has left his body? Would she even recognize him? Would Anthony look as if he were sleeping and could open his eyes once he smelled her familiar perfume? Goodroy opened a door leading to an ordinary-looking office. It was quite small and filled to capacity with file cabinets, boxes, and very green plants. Everest wondered how green plants could flourish in such a small space with no natural light. But there they were, vibrant and alive. The grief counselor, Octavia, rose and stepped away from behind her desk. She was a woman who looked like she had not slept in 24 hours. Her mane was tucked behind both ears, 
but had a wisp of flyaway hair in every direction. She had a small coffee stain near the pocket of her lab coat. The pictures of her family were turned in her direction and not viewable to visitors as a show of compassion. This was so that grieving families would not be subjected to photos of her happy whole family. Octavia pulled out a chair for Evers to sit in as Goodroy stepped outside to give both of them some privacy. Once the door was shut, Octavia redirected all of her focus to Everest. Octavia tried to bring Everest's anxiety down to a manageable level by assuring her that she was there for complete support, whatever that looked like. She introduced herself as Octavia Martin and said she would be there throughout the entire viewing process. She expressed her sympathies for Everest's loss, which was as genuine as it could have been for someone who had never known Anthony. Octavia explained that Anthony had sustained violent trauma during the accident and that viewing him today in person would be possible, but that another option was available. Evers could opt to view photographs instead. This was encouraged by Octavia at this early stage, and she informed Evers that she could wait to see Anthony for the first time at the funeral home. Evers always saw herself as a strong woman, but not when it came to family. Yes, she stood up to her father when it came to leaving the family business, but he knew how to pull her strings. She wavered in her conviction to not become a journeyman because it would have been so much easier to simply do as her father wished. Evers felt comfortable in Octavia's presence and succumbed to her immediate fears of seeing Anthony in his present state by deciding to view the photographs instead. She told herself that viewing his body at this point was not something she could handle. She had a daughter to be strong for, and the decision to view a photograph would keep her at arm's length from reality just a little while longer. Octavia had expected for Everest to choose to view the photograph instead, so she had it on her desk. Without reaching for the photograph, Octavia went into great detail about how the photo would be shown to her. She explained that once she pulled it out, it would be face down on a clipboard. It would be a photograph of Anthony's face only, surrounded by a light cream-colored blanket that hospitals use. Octavia also outlined every mark, abrasion, and cut that Evers would see in Anthony's face that was the result of the accident. Octavia rested her hand on Evers' forearm as she awaited a nonverbal go-ahead cue from her. Evers was comforted by the elaborate details Octavia presented to her, and she was grateful. It was somehow extremely soothing to know exactly what to expect before viewing the photograph of Anthony. Earlier that day, Anthony had taken off from work early to pick up the birthday cake and present for Mo. Evers didn't know who was more excited about the party, Anthony or Mo. Anthony had glanced at his watch, then moved quickly to the door. He was in a hurry and didn't want to be the cause of the party being delayed. Everest exchanged the type of smile with Anthony that only people truly in love exchange. Anthony jettisoned out the door on a mission. That was her last memory. No last kiss to hang on to. Everest nodded her head as Octavia reached for the clipboard. She placed it face down in front of her. She assured Everest that she had all the time in the world to view the photo. No matter what was going on outside that room, Everest was in control. It was up to her to decide if and when she was ready to view the photo. Octavia knew that she could not take away the anguish that Everest was feeling at that very moment, but she could make damn sure that she was not re-traumatized all over again. Everest pulled the clipboard closer to her, but did not turn it over. I'm sorry that you have to experience this with me, Evers stated. Octavia straightened her back in surprise before she leaned into Everest. 
She put one hand on her shoulder before she softly spoke to her, saying that she need not feel sorry for her. Octavia considered it an honor and an unbelievable privilege to be in the room with her. She further explained that she believed dying was as natural as living and that some people have the honor of being there for a person's birth while others have the honor of being there for them upon their passing. A calming sensation rushed over Everest as she picked up the clipboard and flipped it over. That's it. Join me next week for Chapter 4. Counterpunch can be found on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Apple Books, Google Play, and Kobo. Want to leave me a voice message? Visit my anchor.fm page, the link is in the show notes, and click on the button that says Message to leave me one. I may just use your voicemail in a future podcast. Want to suggest a show episode or get in touch? Visit me at authoruncut.com or send me an email at mailbag at patricewilliamsmarks.com. And finally, to join our email list, go to authoruncut.com. Until next time, write on.